but um, yeah, this is the Sigma Z training a um, couple of years ago. But basically, you know, we uh, developed the Sigma Z model somewhat to the, the same issue that 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 um, led um, Hamrick to to produce the, um, the GBC version. Um, to address these uh, uh, pressure gradient error uh, issues that occur when you have, let's see, I've got a little schematic here. Nope. Oh, this is. Oh well, it's okay. Uh, don't even have any schematics in this one. Um, where you have basically, you know, when you have standard sigma stretch grid. You have the same number of layers everywhere in the model domain. So when you have a very steeply sloped um, area and the cells are relatively large, um, the bottom layer of uh, you know a shallow cell and the bottom layer of a deep cell may be literally connected by one or no cell. I mean, just the cell interface is the only interface. And what that it does is it produces induced currents which are not realistic because that water is not really communicating with that water but their their self face is oh there is a figure far enough along oh yeah yeah this is the one that's in our documentation i um so you know in this case i mean it's more gradual but still the same uh issues occur so that, like this cell here you know if you bring it across, that cell there is connected to that cell via these, you know, through the bottom here. And then that cell is connected all the way down here because you've got the bottom layers. This shows them as being kind of a discrete layer, but the, but the, with the actual cell metrics, they're really, it's more of a, a smooth within the internal EFTC code, essentially represents, calculates an average bottom elevation between the, the two cells and an, uh, an average thickness between the two cells. And so you end up with a self face metric that provides a, a little bit smoother uh, computational uh, environment than what it looks like here. But this um, grid format in this kind of environment will set up um, currents that uh, in the model, which are totally numerically uh, induced due to um, the pressure gradient error that, it, that it's uh, getting because of the density differences between what's going on up here versus what's going on down here, and yet they're still kind of computationally connected as the same layer. So uh, what we have done with the, GB, uh, the, the Sigma Z version is kind of take somewhat the GBC concept of a variable um, depth, but a fixed number of layers for each cell and just kind of redid the computational approach completely. Um, pretty much threw out the, the uh, GBC and started over again and ended up with uh, the Sigma Z version, which has two sub options. Um, one, of, one of the options we call the uh, specified bottom and what you do here is you're just specifying the, the bottom active layer in the cells. And you'll see up here, there's three active cells or three active layers. And then it, it kind of progressively, go, progressively goes down to um, the full 10 layers at the, at the deepest uh, part. And so this, this cell here is not connected to this cell. And this cell is not connected to this cell, etc. Now these two, it does it does allow vertical flow here, of course, and it can come up here. And, li and likewise, if there's denser flow, so uh, uh, colder water or saline, you know, uh, more more dense water for whatever reason, coming down this uh, slope here, you know, it, it it can run out into that cell, and then it'll basically just fall down those interfaces like that. And so, Sigma Z approach has take what it. Rather than using a scaling factor, sigma Z, the, I mean, excuse me, the GVC approach uses a scaling factor and then just changes the number of layers and then just uses a scaling factor to scale everything back up to 
um, you know, quote unquote, 10 layers. And so all its computations, every time it was doing any kind of depth calculation or anything, you're always constantly multiplying times a scaling factor. And what we ended up doing is just throwing that whole concept out. But what we do is we calculate at the very beginning of the, of the uh, simulation, we um, calculate cell face metrics everywhere between every, all four faces of every cell so we know how this layer or this bottom connects to this bottom and this bottom connects to this bottom, et cetera. So we know the fraction of the total depth. We know the fraction of blocked areas. It's all mapped out internally in, in uh, a ser series of arrays in, uh, EFD, in the Sigma Z version of it. And then from that, we use all those cell face metrics to do all the computations for um, uh, cell interface calculations. And through that process, we you know, really sped up the, the, the simulation. And you'll see the, the results are basically, for, for stratified systems, I mean, we're getting stuff as good as a, as a, a Z-grid model. So very, very, very uh, good at, at reproducing structure, uh, vertical structure in the system. So this is option one, where you actually specify the bottom. There is an internally computed option, option two, where the attempt is to try to keep the layers as uniform as possible across all the, the cells. And the way that's done is, is that the bottom cell varies in thickness. Um, so you can see that these all basically are, are following roughly the same thickness from cell to cell to cell. But then when you hit the bottom, that cell is much thicker and then it just decreases. Then you get to a minimum, uh, I think it's 20% of the, um, the, the average um, um, DZC, the, 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 set, the sigma thickness, whatever you want to call it. Brain's just fried. Anyways, 20% of that. And then if it, it um, you know, when you exceed that, it basically rolls that last little bit up into the, the cell above it. So essentially what you're doing is just kind of changing the thickness of these bottom cells. But that means your DZC or your relative um, uh, layer thickness changes from cell to cell. So this set of the, the quote-unquote DZC array for this cell is different from this cell, which is different from this cell. And every layer over here, every layer, the DZC here is not the same as the DZC here. So all these metrics are all computed, but they don't have to compute at one time. Then after that, we just use them as, we, as the water levels are changing and Things are happening in the system. Cells are drying out, re-wetting. We have all the cell face metrics we need to, to, to generate the, um, uh, the computational solution. And it's a really easy process to do. After you've set up the model, uh, you just come over here under the domain tab and specify the uh, uh, bottom layer and EE has this tool where you can buy, you just click that button right there and give it a couple of, um, you know, your, the minimum number of layers you're going to allow. And with 8.3, the minimum number of layers went to one. Prior to 8.3, with 8.0 and 8.1 and 8.2, you always had to have at least two active layers in every cell. With 8.3, now it's, you, you can go down to just one active layer in your floodplain, say, for instance, and still have 15 layers uh, deep in the, uh, in the channel. Um, you click that button. It automatically just assigns everything for you, sets it up, creates a, uh, when you save the model, it'll create this SGZ layer dot out, uh, I mean, dot IMP file. Earl oftentimes just, uh, write the zone off of some routine that you've got, <laughs> which is fine because it, it's just an input file. So you can externally generate it uh, if you want, you know, because you want to have a different control from what this is doing. But um, 
So that's, that's one option. But if you select the second option, let's see if I do that. Do I bring them up here anywhere? Uh, this is the zonation. This is, this is when you want to create, you have a global uh, specification for your layering, but you can also have special zones that have their own unique layering scheme. They have to kind of fit together. They have to make sense. But uh, one that's kind of common is, is that, you know, if it's coming out of a mouth of an estuary, um, and, but your interest is over here and you're, you're resolving that sufficiently in the estuary, but your ocean is quite deep. But I don't need 50 layers in the ocean. I don't care that what's going on out there that precisely, and it's not that well, you know, stratified or that uh, significantly stratified. So I may want to, see if it's five, you know, seven layers coming out of the mouth, I'll just assign the entire ocean to seven layers. So that saves significantly on computational time, that type of thing with these uh, uh, sub-zonation uh, capabilities. And I don't know what I was doing there. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Sigma Z, the uh, uniform layering approach. Yeah, that with, the, with the uniform layering, you can't use zonation. That's probably the most significant uh, point to make there. Um, we can add Lake, Lake Mead to this, by the way. Um, Lake Mead has got a, uh, does a really good job now of uh, reproducing uh, its uh, sharp stratification. So we've got uh, Lake Washington. This one had, uh, we had pretty high resolution vertically. Um, this is one of the nice things about uh, the Sigma Z is, again, because you don't compute those layers that are actually in the inactive area. You can have high vertical resolution and still have a reasonably com you know, computational runtime. Um, we actually, the, the Lake Washington model actually runs a full year in like an hour and a half, something like that. It's just all it is is just temperature, but it, it runs quick. Um, grid. Oh, this this version is the old old version that has. It's a little finer than what we're using now. But what's on the web? This this model is sitting out on the web for your download and use to, to play around with. This is one of our demonstration models available for you to download and play. So um, the input and output, well, the output's not all there, but the, some of the summary analysis is. Um, that's what it looks like in uh, cross-section along the longitudinal axes for Lake Washington and across right there in the middle. Um, yeah, just perspective. We're right here where we are right now. Airport is where is it? down here. Airport's down here. This is the Duwamish and Elliott Bay. It's another model. But uh, yeah, airport's down here. They have this site's really got nice. They've got a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week automated buoy system collecting full depth profiles every four hours and they've been doing it since like 9, 2008. <laughs> they've got tons of data on this lake, and it's really nice. Um, so we were able to use, and it's all available sitting out there on the web, so we were able to download all these vertical profiles and all, these, all this uh, data, and they have a, a MET station at the buoy. So we have wind speed, wind direction, air temperature, uh, relative humidity. Um, the only thing they don't have is, is solar radiation. We get that from the airport, uh, and, and so it's uh, cloud cover. All these different stations, that's their data showing different uh, chlorophyll, DO, saturation, pH, conductivity, etc. 
This is the profile that we're trying to match. Input files on top. This is uh, the Sigma Z model on, on the uh, top panel and the Sigma equivalent calibrated Sigma stretch model on the bottom panel. Um, and different times as the times march through the year. Then we're going into fall turnover. We reach fall turnover, and then we kind of march into uh, restratification. You can see, you know, we miss it sometimes, but it does a really good job of tracking with the, uh, the data. And what's interesting with the Sigma Z model, and this, I mean, the Sigma stretch model, and this is a real common issue with these models, you can kind of get the surface right, and you can kind of get the bottom right. You just can't get that structure in between right. That's the hard part. Um, so this tool help, helps you do that. And then we've got, you know, all of our slicing and dicing 3D animation capabilities. This is, this is the, the Lake Washington blanked along the, um, uh, yeah, the eye of a 62 to 85. So this area here is what you see. So everything here has just been cut out. So we can, you can see, you know, watch the, uh, some of the density currents, uh, you know, gravity waves kind of moving through the system, sloshing around in the uh, reservoir due to a wind event or, uh, uh, you know, typically wind events, the bigger, the bigger uh, things that happen on Lake Washington. So, um, 10 Killer Lake. It's, um, yeah, this is in Oklahoma. This is, this is a coarser version of that same model that we looked at earlier. Inflow, the major inflows are up here. A couple of smaller inflows along the dam is down here. Um, so, just uh, kind of looking at some uh, run times, uh, differences. So, we had, this one had 40 layers. And so, at eight hours versus, you know, what, about six hours uh, run time. This is the Sigma stretch grid. So there's 40 layers everywhere. And this is the Sigma Z grid. And then profiles. So th this one was, uh, we've actually, with that revised model, uh, d we actually got it to the RMS to less than one, or right at one degree. Uh, for the, uh, the data and with a, a residual of less than a half a degree. Uh, so we were pretty happy with that because this, this lake has all kinds of, you know, it's not a highly stratified lake. In the middle of the summer, sometimes you get a big flow and it'll turn over. And then it, you know, later uh, you know, in the year, it'll be just like completely stagnant at depth for long periods of time. And then all of a sudden you get all these uh, dynamic processes that are going on. So, um, slicing and dicing of the system, you can just you know see, just you know maintaining good, good stratification. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very true. I mean, that's what I told that. You know, I went to Scott. I, I gave a training at uh, when one of the W two uh, sessions, and we're talking about that. Is that these videos, these animations, they go a long way to kind of demystifying what's going on in these models. Right. Exactly. Now this is temperature, and you can see the stratification. But look at this one here. This is age, um, and um, this one's nice because uh, although do I capture it in the, with at the animation? I hope so. Anyways, uh, you can see density currents kind of coming in and bulging out into the lake. Um, 
So you've got old water above, old water below, and then this lens of fresh water that comes in a little bit there, not, not too much yet. But anyways, um, uh, the, I find that the, especially in reservoirs, the age simulation is a huge uh, of use in trying to understand the dynamics of what's going on in, in your reservoir. See right there, just like that right there. So you had a slug of colder water came in and just basically displaced your older water. So you had older water above and older water below. And there you had a nice density current kind of following, you know, the bottom. Does, uh, yeah, that, that age sim, uh, constituent, um, we, we, did, we uh, did it with uh, W2, and then we added it here because it was so useful uh, for, you know, looking at these dynamics. And that is that. Other questions? Yeah, you go ahead and have the, the PDF just. Uh, okay. Um, TikTok, what else? <laughs> 